Yes, and we're going to take your calls as well on 0839133728. Good morning, Dr. Green. Very good morning. Good to have you here. We're talking Thank about high-risk malaria areas. And as much as we love swimming, we also know that there's a lot of safety that needs to and precautions that need to be taken. We're going to talk about that shortly. But let's get to malaria sure. first. Which are high-risk areas during this time of the year? Yes, I think people forget that when it gets to summer, a lot of moisture content attracts mosquitoes, and that's how malaria is transferred. So uh, North Natal, known for its humidity and heat, then Limpopo, obviously, as well, and then the northern province itself. So, uh, you know, the endemic areas of malaria in South Africa are well known to be associated around our Kruger National Park ah, area, okay. way up north. But we've had cases all the way uh, into Limpopo at Messina as well. So uh, important for people that live around that area and those visiting those beautiful areas to know about it. Tell me about the transmission. So how is malaria transmitted and why don't mosquitoes have malaria? <laughs> Good question. I think uh, mosquitoes, when they actually bite you, they introduce a parasite into your bloodstream. And that parasite then, then, then travels all the way to your liver where it reproduces and goes through a life cycle. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an organism called plasmodium and the different subtypes, Vivax and ovale and falciparum. After that, then they travel to the different systems of your body, and that's why you can get generalized symptoms of fever, vomiting, headaches, etc. But then you also get ones that travel to the brain, can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause cerebral malaria, ah. which can be devastating. I was going to ask you the difference between the two. Now, we've got a lot of kiddies watching. Uh, t put us to ease, at ease. Uh, there's Not all mosquitoes give us malaria. No, no, no. The Anopheles mosquito specifically. And it's a female, of course. Ah, <laughs> you see. So there is a difference. Cerebral malaria and then normal malaria, the common one. What's the yes. difference? Yes. The difference is basically the specific organism involved and the ability to cross over infection into the blood-brain barrier. Um, so, in other words, the systemic involvement would, would, for example, move from the liver into the gut and it will spread into the bloodstream but won't have the devastating effects of neurological symptoms mm -hmm. like seizures and coma and funny posturing movements, etc. Generally, people will have just fever and uh, perhaps vomiting and sometimes even skin manifestations of malaria. Okay, well, we're talking about malaria this morning and also high-risk areas. We're also talking about safety and swimming. Now, I always say when there's water and children, the two don't go together. A child should always be supervised near water, specifically small children that aren't, uh, that aren't able to whip themselves out of a little small bucket of water, for sure. example. And well, we're talking about safety around water, and this is how we protect our children. Most children are drawn to water, especially during the hot summer holidays. But water-related accidents happen so often and so quickly that water safety education is vital in ensuring you keep your kids safe around pools and swimming areas. So many accidents happen the moment we turn our backs, we quickly go into the house. What can we as parents and guardians do to ensure that poolside accidents don't occur? The very important thing that I would advise is from a very young age, let your children start swimming. Because by the time they, uh, they turn five, they should know the basics. But still, I would say never leave them alone in the pool area. Secondly, once they're done swimming, make sure that all the pool toys are removed because your young one might come back and be tempted to reach out for it and they can accidentally fall in. And then the third thing is during social gatherings, always nominate a parent or a caregiver that can swim to be the designated watcher. And I suppose it's important when you're not using the pool to make sure your kids don't have access to it. You can either have a net fitted in when they are not swimming, but something permanent that I would recommend is to have your pool enclosed by a fence that's at least 1.2 meters high and that doesn't have any gaps that exceed 10 centimeters in diameter so that a child can squeeze through it. You should also never allow your children to play near the drain area because items of clothing or their hair can get sucked and tangled inside. So always make sure that your drain covers are properly sealed and you can also install multiple drains so that it reduces the suction flow of each drain. Are there any emergency aids we can use to assist us in case something does happen? A pool safety ring you can keep nearby as well as a cell phone with emergency contact details on speed dial and a first aid kit. Shamima, how reliable is inflatable toys and swimwear to keep our kids from drowning? We shouldn't rely completely on inflatable toys like water wings and foam noodles to keep them safe. There should always be a parent on standby. Another important aspect of pool safety is the harmful effects of the sun. So always make sure that children wear loose 
cool clothing, hats and sunglasses. And when applying sunscreen, at least do so 15 minutes before they go outside and apply it regularly throughout the day. Not forgetting areas like the tips of their nose, the back of their neck, their ears and their lips. Make sure you and your children practice good safety habits outdoors and by the pool because the best summer is a safe summer. Safety around the house to make sure that we can enjoy our summer over the holiday season. Well, Dr. Darren Green is joining us this morning. We're talking about malaria and also malaria areas. Now, we are in South Africa. It's here as well. Preventions. How do we prevent all of this? I mean, we're a little bit fearful now because you're talking about mosquitoes and malaria. Malaria is like crime. You have to protect yourself ah. in layers. So you've got to start way back there. You've got to repel the insects, for mm. example, by using the right kind of uh, insecticide for air, for airborne insects inside your tent. But before even getting inside your tent, your accommodation, your caravan, wherever you're gonna be, you need to start off with the meshes and the nets right at the gate, at the, at the door, the zip of your tent. Okay. So those, the, those nets need to be inspected and checked for, for any tears, etc. And then we move, obviously, in, in, inward. What about tablets? In terms of medical prophylaxis, so preparing medically for it, there are three options. Uh, and obviously the, the age group of, of children and, and pregnancy comes into play as well, as you can imagine. Can I take it? You can in the second and, and third trimester. There are okay. certain drugs that you can take. And uh, the first one is mefloquine. Uh, which is well known and that one can be used from a child weighing five kilograms that's about right. three months onwards and then uh, as i said ladies in the second and third trimester but they do have significant side effects uh, and they can't be used in people that go skydiving for example deep sea diving scuba diving wait a minute doctor i remember once taking malaria tablets yes. as prevention because i was going to a malaria ridden area and yes. i was dreaming i was hallucinating yes does it happen it happens it okay. certainly does it's one of the side effects of some of the, the malaria drugs okay. and uh, with this one specifically you must specifically remember the visuospatial disturbances in other words things like scuba diving deep sea diving, etc. You've got to know about it because it can make it worse. Okay. You could get dizzy and pass out. Okay. Uh, so, and then obviously the next one is doxycycline, which is a, like an antibiotic. So right. uh, the, the, the similarities between doxycycline and the first one, mefloquine, is that they both have to be taken before you go oh, away. Okay. And then unfortunately afterwards up to a period of uh, four to six weeks so that makes it a bit, a bit tedious and then you, you run the risk of having all the effects of taking antibiotics chronically okay. the GIT side effects you know the, the diarrhea etc but doxy specifically known for, for for skin conditions and sensitivity to the Sun so you have to sunblock up if you're going to use doxy uh, and then of course the, the last group is actually the more modern group but very expensive and that's called uh, malinol Okay. And uh, melanol is very useful. Uh, you only take it for a week after being exposed. See, I like that. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> short duration afterwards. 083 913 3, 3, if you want to give us a call. We've Indeed. got Garrick on the line. You're live on Expresso. What is your question or comment to Dr. Green? Hi, good morning, Doctor. How are you? Morning, Garrick. I'm good, thank you. Um, I just would like to ask you, my son-in-law Yes. was up in Zimbabwe about four weeks ago. And he subsequently came back and he collapsed. They said he had a heart attack. Jeez. Okay, but they're not sure. Mm. But he's been suffering since he's got back from knee pains mm -hmm. um, uh, and general body pains. And he's, he's become very weak. They've had him in hospital. And his skin color is a yellowy color. Very, uh, it's, a, it's a funny sort of color. Mm. Yes, got that. Okay, yeah. thank you so much for your call, and we're very sorry for your loss. There, a call that he actually passed out after coming back from uh, an area that he suspected had malaria. What's your question? Uh, what's your comments on that? Yes, he, he says he seems to be suffering from headaches, mm. and then the yellow skin discoloration, obviously, and intermittent fever. Mm. And that certainly does raise warning bells, because all those symptoms can be ascribed to malaria, but they also can be ascribed to some other diseases as well. Yellow skin, we know, is associated with jaundice and liver conditions, so we have to be careful careful of not missing a, a hepatitis or an obstructive jaundice picture and in this case specifically after traveling one would certainly want to at least screen him for malaria because he might have gone through areas endemic to malaria as well mm. so uh, there's a simple blood test a thick and th uh, thin blood film that they do and they actually study the cells of the blood and look for the presence of the, the, mal the malaria um, and, uh, 
bacteria. Mm. Gary Kavuri, sorry for your loss and thanks so much for your calls that came through this morning. Um, uh, but uh, I'm told by our producers that he's still alive, he's fine. Yes, yes, yes. I think okay. he said he, co he collapsed and he passed collapsed. out. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Gary, for Thank you making for sure that he's alive and safe. But prevention is better than cure. Indeed. So before you go, you need to make sure that you take all those malaria prevention <laughs> tablets and like doctor said, keep the zip up so that the mosquitoes don't come in. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank morning. Thank you. Okay, malaria-ridden areas and also safety around the pool. Doctor, well, staying with us, but we're talking more about what's happening on the show. You and what you got.